years ago, years ago I, uh, <clears throat> I gave a lecture at the annual conference of the uh, German Jews Association. It was supposed to start at uh, 7 o'clock. At uh, 7 and a quarter, the uh, master of conferences uh, came up and said, uh, this is the German Jewish Association. We start everything on time. Reset your watches. This is now exactly seven o'clock. <laughs> so time is a very fluid, is a very fluid concept. And so is history. History is by definition global. First, everything is history. If it's uh, past, it's ours. These sentences, this gathering, this room, everything you say, history. And if it isn't history now, it will be in a minute. Have patience. But that's not all. Historians are great believers in the matrix, not the movie, uh, but the combination of circumstances that surrounds, surrounds us. Economy and religion, uh, high culture and the kindergartens, Coca-Cola and Ezra Pound, everything is connected. <clears throat> the perfect historian then is God. He truly sees the big picture and the many small pictures uh, it is made of. But since there is no God, as I've just argued in my latest book, we have to make do with the next best thing, global historians. We're lucky to have with us uh, two of the best among them, Sanjay Subramanian and Ken Pomerant, have just won uh, the most prestigious prize we have in Israel. And this is a, a good moment to say a word about this prize. I think it's a, it's a prize that pays attention to the humanities, which is wonderful. It's a prize that looks at the past, which is wonderful for us. And it's a prize that has a very distinguished and very impressive list of uh, laureates. And I think we should uh, be proud of being part of this, this project and of this prize and having with us both uh, Ariel David and, uh, Gabi, and Gabi David, who are uh, part of the, uh, the family that donated this, uh, this prize. Now, to introduce uh, our, uh, our guest, let me invite a friend and a colleague, Professor Miri Leafeldon, who has written a very important book on imposters. Uh, but this may have nothing to do with present company, of course. Miri, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Aviad. I hope that my uh, claim to fame will not be only imposters. <laughs> um, it's really an honor and a pleasure to welcome and to introduce our two distinguished guests. Uh, I'm here not just as a uh, colleague of, of Aviad's at the School of History, but also as the chairperson of the Historical Society of Israel, and it is uh, uh, also our uh, honor and our pleasure to, uh, to welcome such guests. Uh, when uh, introducing uh, distinguished scholars such as our guests today, it is difficult not to sound as if reading entries from Wiki Wikipedia. Or Wikipedia. Uh, so instead, <laughs> I shall read what I wrote about Professor Sanjay Subramanian to the Dan David Prize Committee when I no nominated him for the prize. And then I'll read what I would have written about Professor Pomerantz had I been the one to nominate him for the prize. Uh, professor Subram Subramanian, presently the distinguished professor and Irving at John Stone Chair in Social Sciences at, in the Department of History at UCLA, coined the term connected histories in 2004 and this is a term that has become by now an accepted version of a global history or world history. And it refers to a scholarly approach which can be pursued only by exceptionally talented and erudite historians, as both our guests today are. Uh, the civilizations of the four continents first became interconnected during the 15th century. Europe, Europe then became the epicenter of economic, cultural, and political upheavals which changed the world. Professor Subramanian in his books and in innumerable articles has shown that looking at these global developments from the perspective of the Indian subcontinent would, could offer a novel understanding of the emergence of modernity. It is thus not surprising that he was asked to be one of the editors 
uh, of the Cambridge World History, Volume 6, The Construction of a Global World, 1400 to 1800, published in 2015. Subramaniam's The Career and Legends of Vasco da Gama, translated into four languages, is a masterly and as yet unsurpassed biography of one of the Age of Discovery's major protagonists. His two most recent books, Europe's India, Words, People, Empires, 1500 to 1800, published by Harvard University Press in 2017, and Empires Between Islam and Christianity, 1500 to 1800, published by Sunni Press in 2018, cover an astonishing widespread consideration of the Iberian, Ottoman, and Mughal worlds including questions of political economy, images, representations, and historiography. These two works are the epitome of macro-history macro at its best. Indeed, the challenge of macro-history is to widen the scope of research <clears throat> so as to see over the horizon and to connect civilizations, histories, and peoples whose stories have been hitherto uh, studied in unsplendid isolation. Professor Subramaniam successfully contends with this challenge while meticulously basing all his work on primary sources which he retrieves from archives all over the world. Uh, what makes Professor Subramaniam's work so extraordinary is that he never writes about what he does not know. He is, uh, he is unlike some of us. Um, he is distinguished by his erudition, by his astonishingly, astonishingly broad and deep knowledge of the many connected histories that he has made his own. In 2007, Sanjay Subramanian delivered a series of three lectures for the Jerusalem Lectures in History in memory of Menachem Stern. Uh, and these lectures were first published in English under the title Three Ways to be Alien, Travails and Encounters in the Early Modern World by Brandeis University, and later translated into French and Hebrew, called in Hebrew Shalosh Drachim Liot Zar, published by the Israel Historical Society. Three Ways to be an Alien is an extraordinary achievement in presenting global history by telling the stories, if you like, micro-histories, of three men who found themselves playing a role in the politics and culture of several states in Eurasia. It is also an example of how macro-history can be told without losing sight of the individuals who made up the global drama. In some ways, Sanjay Subramanian is himself a cosmopolitan figure Born and educated in India, he has become an internationally acclaimed scholar, invited to teach in the most prestigious universities in Europe and, in, and the Americas, perfectly fluent in a dozen languages, awarded fellowships and honors throughout the world. He and his masterly academic accomplishments are perfect proof that East and West can and should meet. Professor Kenneth Pomerantz is the University Professor of History at the University of Chicago. Professor Pomerantz is first and foremost a historian of China, specializing in the economic, ecological, and state-building aspect of late imperial and 20th century China. His first book, The Making of a Hinterland, State, Society, and Economy in, the inland, in, in, in Inland North China, 1853 to 1937, published by the University of, of California Press in 1993, is based on a wealth of sources and analyzes how economic change was influenced by both national and local forces. But, what, but quite early in his career, Professor Pomerantz turned to comparative questions in what came to be called global history. Indeed, he was one of the founding editors of the Journal of, Go, uh, of Global History. The need to look and understand historical developments in continents other than Europe was first posed explicitly by William McNeil in, in, the, in the 1960s in his book, The Rise of the West and the World History. McNeil was followed by historians such as David Landis in his, among others, the, the Wealth and Poverty of Nations, or Eric Jones in The European Miracle. 
and a few others who sought explanations for European exceptionalism and hegemony since at least the beginning of the 19th century. Professor Pomerantz, one could say, followed in their footsteps, first in a book written with Stephen Topic, The World of Trade Created, Society, Culture and the World Economy, 1400 to the Present, and then with his most influential masterwork, The Great Divergence, China, Europe and the Making of the Modern, of the Modern World Economy, published by Princeton University Press in 2000. Yet unlike his predecessors, whose explanation Explanations for the so-called European miracle were based mostly on stressing the unique characteristics of Western Europe and on speculations regarding the political, cultural, or ecological shortcomings of the other great civilizations. Professor Pomerantz offered a wealth of mostly economic evidence that Europe and China, as well as India and Japan, enjoyed enjoyed basically similar conditions until 7, uh, 750. His own thesis concerning the, reason, the reasons for the divergence, to try and put it in a net, nutshell, what, what appears in his uh, hundreds of pages of books, is the distribution of coal deposits and Europe's advantage thanks to its access by a lucky accident to the riches of the new world. Kenneth Pomerantz's work won him a fully deserved large number of prizes and honors. Apparently, he's the only scholar to have won twice the John King Fairbank Prize for the best book in East Asian history. And he's also a corresponding fellow of the British Academy. To all these, he now may add the Dan David Prize. We are now eagerly looking forward to his forthcoming book, which will answer the big question, why is China so big? Yeah, both these, <laughs> and to conclude, both these exceptionally learned scholars have, have taught us, that is, historians of Europe, an important lesson in humility. It is a true honor to have them here for us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary, for this concise and... Uh, an exciting uh, introduction. And without further ado, <clears throat> I would like to invite uh, Professor Subramaniam to uh, talk about connected histories of the early modern world between uh, the macro and the micro. Dear Miri and dear friends, uh, I see a number of them in the audience. Um, so before I get uh, started uh, on the main part of uh, what I want to say, I do need to acknowledge the fact that I have, of course, a long-standing and uh, very uh, uh, interesting and I think intricate connection uh, with Israel and with Israeli academics. Uh, I did deliver the uh, Menachem Stern lectures now 12 years ago, uh, but uh, besides that and now the the Dan David Prize, of course, I should uh, mention that uh, perhaps one of the uh, moments which uh, in many ways sort of changed my career once and for all was uh, a good number of years ago, 1987, when I first met my friend David Schulman uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, which he was visiting and I was visiting, and then we started a, a long and very fruitful collaboration which persists uh, even to today and which sort of opened up uh, the worlds of uh, of uh, cultural history, literary history, to someone who at that time was uh, really little more than a Philistine economist. Uh, so, um, uh, what then is uh, is uh, connected history for our purposes, and what uh, sort of motivated uh, the process by which uh, we, uh, I, it, it came to be created, or it emerged, or whatever? Uh, just a few days ago, I was actually uh, um, at an event uh, in Bordeaux, which is university I'm visiting right now, uh, at the big bookshop there, some of you will know the library Mola, and it was a conversation between myself and uh, a, a close friend who is also a very great historian, Carlo Ginsburg, and we were, uh, we were actually talking about uh, the title of uh, our conversation was uh, L'Historien et ses ancêtres, uh, the historian and his ancestors, and we were actually exchanging notes on his ancestors and mine, and sometimes on our common ancestors. 
uh, by which uh, I don't mean, uh, of course, we could have talked about Natalia Ginsburg, but that's not what we were talking about. We were talking about our intellectual ancestors. And amongst those intellectual ancestors, uh, for instance, we would, amongst the common ones, count, let's say, uh, Mark Bloch. Um, I would perhaps uh, count Brodel. Uh, he would not, I don't think. Um, he would count Delio Cantimori. I would not. And so on. So interesting, uh, uh, interesting sort of uh, convergences and divergences. Now, to the question of uh, connected history, one way of approaching it is indeed to ask, um, uh, what are its ancestors, and, and where did we uh, come to this? Uh, first of all, I should say that the, the context in which connected history uh, emerged, uh, uh, to, to my mind, was um, because I was in a debate, actually. And often, my best ideas come when I get angry about something. Uh, and this debate was a debate with a, with a very well-known American historian of Southeast Asia, Victor Lieberman, uh, who was writing a very vast comparative history, which eventually emerged in the form of two volumes called Strange Parallels. Some of you will know these. Don't drop them on your foot. Uh, so these huge volumes of, of comparative history uh, were uh, essentially uh, forms of what I thought of as mechanistic comparison. So, for instance, uh, the argument that, let's say, Burma is actually quite like Spain, or Vietnam in the 17th century was really rather like Portugal, or something of this kind, right? So you, you actually have these parallels and these comparisons between, between Southeast Asian states, especially mainland Southeast Asian states, and, and the European states. And it struck me that um, at some point, you know, uh, uh, not always, uh, surely comparative history, and that's one of the things we learned from Bloch, is uh, one of the building blocks, the basic building blocks that all historians and indeed all sociologists and anthropologists use. The comparison is really the heart of many things in our profession. But uh, comparison, when it runs out of control, can uh, become a problem. And so I suggested, rather, that uh, we should uh, perhaps not always think in terms of those well-defined geographical units which we have been handed in the past. Because those geographical units, uh, which are meant to be units of utility and for the purposes of thinking, can become obstacles at a certain point. So, for instance, uh, take, take India. Right. So, uh, as an Indian historian who was educated in India, uh, I was always struck by the fact that uh, we study India, we study India with a desperate passion and intensity. But, ask your average or even your above average Indian historian about Sri Lanka. Just down the road from us, what do they know about it? Well, perhaps they know one or two little facts about it, and these are usually facts which reflect to the glory of Indian history, such as, we sent them Buddhism. Right? So that's, that's an idea that we have, right? We sent them Buddhism. Uh, the, uh, uh, some of them, some Indian historians who are better educated will tell you that the foundation myth of Sri Lanka, of the so-called landing of Prince Vijaya, is of someone who came from Bengal, and so on and so forth. So that's, a, that's about all we know about Sri Lankan history. Uh, even people who live in the part of India that I come from originally, Tamil Nadu, which is really just down the road from Sri Lanka, know precious little about it. Why? Why? Because essentially we have inherited this notion that the history we should know is of our nation state. Right? And this is the point at which you, you, you begin to realize that, uh, the, that these kinds of geographical divisions of a certain type, which are meant to actually facilitate thinking, can become obstacles to thinking. I could actually give you the, uh, the obvious second example, and it's of course a very pressing example from, from today, uh, which is, for instance, uh, in the last few years when the question came up, the so-called Rohingyas, right? This population uh, which sort of is between uh, Eastern India, Bangladesh, and Burma, uh, this uh, population of, of Muslims who have now become largely stateless people and so on. Uh, well, uh, if you actually ask your typical Indian historian, what do you know about these people? The answer is nothing because it's not our problem. It, it belongs to Burmese history. If you ask the Burmese historians, what do you know about these people? They will give you exactly the same answer, right? So again, a typical notion where uh, the fact that uh, the histo histories that have emerged have been uh, histories which have a certain very rigid geography to them. Right? And uh, the point is, at some moment or another, you realize that if you are the one who is willing to step outside the geographies and take that risk, well, there are returns to be had. Right? So that's essentially one of the notions with which I began uh, thinking about, about connected histories. And then, of course, uh, the fact is uh, that there are precedents. Uh, I would be the last person to deny it. Uh, 
So let me mention at least three uh, precedents, and uh, uh, some of these people may not be very well known to you. Uh, one of them, uh, to my mind, very important for me personally, was an Indian historian by the name of uh, Oshin Das Gupta, who was actually a, a historian who was based largely in Calcutta. Uh, he was not my, my, uh, on my dissertation committee, but he was one of my external examiners, and he gave me a very hard time in the dissertation exam, I have to say. Uh, but uh, we became friends thereafter, uh, and he uh, was a, a wonderful uh, a writer. He wrote some very good books, for instance, about the history of Kerala. He wrote another book, which is a classic, about the port of Surat in Western India in the early 18th century. And uh, he always told me, for instance, that uh, he had, uh, he had these, these great relations with people when he had studied in England who had taught him things, uh, people like uh, Albert Hurani and, and uh, for instance, uh, Robert Bertram Sargent, specialist of the Hadramaut and so on. And he had thought about these things in relation to these. He has a wonderful sort of uh, uh, lapidary phrase in one of his articles in which he says, in order to understand India, you have to go out of India. Right. And uh, that's a phrase which I, if I, if, you know, someone, you know, uh, they always said that uh, Frank Sinatra on his tombstone should have, uh, I did it my way. Uh, you know what he actually has on his uh, tombstone is the best is yet to come. Uh, <laughs> however, if, 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 if I, I, of course, I'm a Hindu and will not have a tombstone, but if it were, if, if I were to have a tombstone, it sh they should put on it, I mean, in order to understand India, you have to go out of India. Right? So um, that's one person who I think influenced me in my, my sense that in order to actually uh, understand India, you have to place it in a context. That context for Das Gupta was the Indian Ocean. So it was placing India in relation to West Asia, to the Persian Gulf, uh, to the Red Sea, to East Africa, uh, also to Southeast Asia. Uh, das Gupta was someone who knew the archives of the East India companies very well, uh, in particular the Dutch East India Company. Um, so that's a, 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 an excellent example, once again, of a, of a, a small and, and, you might say, uh, apparently quite provincial country, but whose archives actually open up things on a global scale to you if you so choose. So that's one person whom I would, I would definitely mention. A second person who, for me, was very important uh, looked at this whole matter from a very different point of view, which was a French historian by the name of Jean Aubin. Aubin was someone who started out his career as a specialist of Iran and Central Asia. And he studied, uh, really, a whole series of questions having to do with uh, the post-Mongol world. So uh, we are looking then, in his case, at uh, the, the Temur and the Timurids, his great article, uh, Comment uh, Tamerlan Prenait les Villes, uh, which appeared in the 1950s on, on, on Timur's conquests of the cities. Uh, but then he also studied a large number of things such as obscure questions or obscure little dynasties such as the Karakhetai, for instance. Uh, Mikhail Biran, if she was here, would know very well what I'm talking about. Uh, so these are questions that he began from. Then he studied Iran under the Safavids. Uh, he studied the Ottomans. But then he uh, suffered from a heart condition and he could not travel anymore. So he decided that uh, since he couldn't take planes anymore, he was going to change his focus. He began working on Portugal. So he then went into the Portuguese archives, and since he already knew all these things about the Islamic world, he decided he was going to look at the Portuguese empire from the perspective of the Portuguese interactions with the Islamic world. So that was essentially how he did it, but he did it from the ground up. No grand schemes, no um, sort of uh, global uh, sort of, uh, abstract perspectives in the Wallachian sense, but really doing it from the ground up based on a kind of philological method. Um, and, and Obama was someone who, I mean, I, I always, each time I met him, he would say really surprising things to me. So I, I remember on one occasion asking him what he was working on, and he said he was working on the great Portuguese Renaissance intellectual Damien de Goes. Now Damien de Goes was, a, was an Erasmian in Portugal in the 16th century, but Damien de Goes actually had at some point in his life a hypothesis about Ethiopia uh, and about uh, the links between the Ethiopians and other peoples in the world. And for some reason, he decided that the Ethiopians had something to do with the natives of Lapland. So in order to, to pursue this hypothesis, Damien de Goes began a correspondence with the uh, Bishop of Uppsala to look into this matter. And Aubin, in order to pursue this correspondence, decided to learn Swedish, right? which, he, which he then uh, did uh, quite, quite successfully. And he then proceeded to actually build on this. And there are other articles of his where these materials sort of come through. So this is someone who's building a story, so to speak, 
from the ground up, from an investment in the archives, from this incredible capacity he had, and which I've seen, you know, of reading practically any uh, archival document you could put in front of him in the languages that he, that he knew. So a different perspective. A third name, uh, and that would be someone who's actually someone who might, you, know, you might say, uh, link uh, myself and, and Ken, which is Joseph Fletcher, a great historian of China who actually uh, wrote essays concerning how uh, China in the period of the Ming and especially the Qing should be thought of in relation to Tibet, should be thought of in relation to Inner Asia and Central Asia and the Islamic world. Now, this is much before your typical Qing historian is thinking about uh, the fact that in order to do Qing history, it's not enough to know Chinese, but you should, uh, for certain purposes, you should, for instance, know Manchu or in his case, uh, or, or Fletcher, that he should actually think about uh, the whole question of how uh, the, uh, the, the foundation, the refoundation of, of the Chinese state by the Qing or the Manchu has to do with questions also linked to Central Asia and, and, and beyond. So here are, are three quite, uh, quite distinct uh, examples. Now, as you can see, uh, over here, uh, uh, you know, I come from the social sciences, and I come from a training in economics. But um, one thing which I did learn from talking to these people was uh, the importance and actually the crucial importance uh, of, uh, of sort of retraining yourself to think philologically also. Right? Um, uh, and here again, you know, uh, there's also another sort of uh, common ancestor that, that, that Ginsburg and I could claim, though much closer to him than to me, which is, for instance, someone like Mobiliano, who reflected on the genealogy of the historian's profession, where he talks about philology and antiquarianism as being, in a way, the, the, the genealogical uh, ancestors of, of modern historical practice. And that's something which I, I have to say I believe in, together with, of course, the fact that the social sciences are significant and highly, highly important important for, for all of us. And I think that once one has passed through people like Aubin and Das Gupta and Fletcher, it makes perfect sense to remember that the macro uh, must always uh, be done in relation to the micro. Right? That uh, the, 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 the historian who works on a large scale, I do not think can afford to uh, simply work out of uh, secondary literature uh, and uh, the often dubious generalizations which other people have produced without your having any control over the basis on which they produced that intermediate level of, of generalizations. So for me, uh, finally, if, if one does macro history, one has to do that macro history. You have to, is that uh, the phrase of Tony? You have to muddy your boots, right? You have to get your boots dirty. In the, uh, in the archives, in the materials, and indeed even in, uh, in, in, in the form of, of, of uh, working in the field, if, if, if that's, that's what the questions that you're studying, you're studying uh, take. So that's one set of, of, of uh, reflections that I would, I would like to bring to you. And um, once again, you can see that uh, this idea that the macro and the micro uh, must be linked together uh, and uh, that there's a sort of going back and forth between them is uh, uh, certainly something which uh, a number of other historians would, uh, would agree with me about. And in their practice, um, you would see them, you would uh, distinctly see them, see them doing. Of course, there are also other historians uh, out there in the world today uh, who don't believe in this. And I don't need to point fingers on name names. You can, as we say in, uh, uh, in Portuguese, no precisamos de fotografia. I don't need to show you their photos, right? So uh, you can figure it out for yourself who I'm talking about. Very successful sometimes. But, I mean, when you start looking at it, uh, looking at what these generalizations are based on, uh, I mean, uh, in some cases I feel to myself, you know, please never look at these people's footnotes because they are never going to get you anywhere. You're going to actually have a text and a footnote, and the footnote and the text don't have any real relationship. Right? So uh, uh, there, is, there are these two uh, or three different kinds of approaches, and, and I think I'm pretty clear about, about where I stand on those questions. But there's also a further question which I think is, is worth uh, uh, reflecting on, which is that as one, which is the role of chance, actually, uh, which is, of course, that as one sort of goes through one's career, and I've had the good luck of working in a number of different places, right? So I started in, in Delhi. I taught in Delhi up until the middle of the 1990s. Then I was invited to move to Paris to the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales. I taught there for about 10 years. Then I moved to Oxford for a couple of years, uh, which was not a very successful experiment, I'm sad to say. And then I moved to the U.S., but then now I've moved back to France, so I keep one foot in uh, Paris and one foot in the U.S. 
And all of this is for me an opportunity. It's an opportunity to talk to all kinds of people, new people all the time, and to actually profit from things which I see them doing and I think to myself, now, that's a good idea. Now, why, why can't I do that? And of course, the first answer why you can't do that is because you're not competent to do it. So then that's the question of the Archbishop of Uppsala, isn't it? So then how do you actually make yourself competent to do it? And that's what I uh, often uh, would uh, take away and like to tell my students, which is I often try to tell my doctoral students, you know, who especially in, in America are often you know, completely, uh, they're nervous wrecks by the time they finish their PhD, right? Uh, and then they think, you know, there's the PhD, there's the tenure process, and all of this is going to kill us. And I always tell them, you know, this is, this is really not the problem. The problem is what do you do afterwards? Are you capable of inventing a second project, and a third project, and a fourth project? And, uh, and the question is, what do all those things take? So let me give you an example of, of what, uh, what I mean by that. So um, somewhere in the, in, the, in the late 1990s, I began to sort of realize that my colleagues in Paris, uh, many of them, were doing something which I had never really engaged with, which is were actually both historians working in the archives and with textual materials, but were actually working very extensively with visual materials. Right? So, uh, and I realized that I had really not thought of this as an, as an option, partly because when I was trained in, in Delhi, uh, you know, the art history uh, part of our training and of the university was a relatively weak uh, part of it. And also, the art history tended to be very descriptive. You know, so you'd actually have people writing articles where they would say, uh, this painting shows a fakir sitting on a lotus with a snake hanging over his head. Thank you, I can see that in the painting, right? <laughs> so uh, we, we, we actually uh, were not very well uh, sort of inclined to that. And, and, and I realized that it was possible uh, for you to retrain yourself. All you had to do was spend a lot of time talking to art historians, going to museums, talking to mu uh, the specialists in the museums, talking to other people who were doing other kinds of things. For instance, I realized that compared to us uh, working on, say, South Asia or the Indian Ocean, the Latin American historians were far in advance of us in this question. So I spent a lot of time with them, talking to them, looking at the kinds of things which, which they were doing. Uh, talking, of course, to the European, uh, European historians, uh, specialists, for instance, of questions like, uh, like uh, uh, Netherlandish art in the 17th century, which eventually came to influence some of my own reflections. Um, for instance, some of you may know that uh, Rembrandt uh, did about uh, 25 drawings based on Mughal miniatures. And so the whole question is, what was he doing? Uh, what did he actually copy these things for? What he did, did he then do with the things that he copied, and so on and so forth? Again, questions which fall between the stools. Specialists of Dutch art don't really want to do so, uh, very much with it, because it seems like this is a very marginal part of Rembrandt's life. But on the other hand, uh, people working on India don't think this is tremendously important as a question having to do with Indian art history. But in fact, it is a very interesting question of what was happening. There's an underlying process of how the Mughal miniatures started coming to the Netherlands. Right? And we know this has to do with the history of the Dutch East India Company again. And then we actually know that some of these survive. You can look at them, you can analyze them in relation. And then there's a the question of what Rembrandt uh, did with them and what some of Rembrandt's lesser-known com contemporaries did with them. Very interesting things, actually. So um, this is an example, then, of, of sort of also trying to, trying to uh, shift the ground to keep yourself young, to keep yourself going by learning new things. Uh, I don't believe in that old adage that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You can. Um, and uh, so I think that's also a part of the, the sort of shifting horizons of the historians uh, being able to take on board uh, methods. Again, to come back to my conversation with Ginsburg, I mean, you know, he burnt himself because when he actually got into art history, famously he wrote the book on Piero della Francesca, and the art historians really got very nasty with him. So it's a risk. It's a risk. And uh, you have to uh, do a certain amount of captatio bene valencia in your introduction, saying you know much more than I do and all that kind of stuff. But, but it's worth doing. And you have to keep moving, keep learning, and so on and so forth. So um, basically, um, that's sort of to give you a sense of sort of where this comes from, the kinds of things which it involves. Um, just to give you a very brief uh, idea, uh, this is the kinds of things which I then took on board in the uh, last but one book which I wrote, which is called Europe's India. So it's actually looking at how the European, the shifting European construction of what India was before the high colonial period. Uh, 
Uh, it's again a book which is constructed in a kind of an argument, right? Uh, uh, like many people of my generation, I read and profited from, but also disagreed with Edward Said's Orientalism. And so it's in a way, it's a book which is in a conversation with that kind of approach to how Europe looked at non-Europe. I wanted to make the argument. And here, again, to show you a sense of the borrowings, uh, this is partly because I've had a lot of conversations with historians of science. So it seemed to me that it's really worthwhile looking at the concrete conditions of the production of knowledge, uh, who these people were who were writing some of these texts, why, in what circumstances, and so on and so forth. So I looked very closely at some of those questions running from, let's say, Portuguese missionaries in the 16th century uh, talking about uh, kashta, uh, this word which has now become so associated with India, but which is their word. The word for caste is, after all, a Portuguese word which came to India for the first time in the 16th century, which has now become common currency to talk about India. Or, for instance, looking at someone like, uh, some people like the great uh, collectors who who created the first European museum collections of Indian materials, uh, people like the Swiss mercenary Antoine Louis-Henri Pollier, who actually first brought the Vedas uh, as a text, as a written text uh, to India, which is today in the, in the uh, Bodleian Library, uh, and also there's a version in the British Library. So these kinds of people, what were they trying to do? Uh, neither to glorify them uh, or to give them a certificate of virginity, um, nor uh, to uh, cast them as, uh, as villains who came purely with prejudices and then looked for knowledge which was merely going to confirm them in their prejudices, which is, I think, more than a case of the historian confirming himself or herself in their prejudices rather than the actors themselves. So to, uh, to conclude then, I mean, so I, 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 I try to uh, keep moving on these, on these different fronts and on these different scales. Um, I still consider myself a historian of India. So I do write things sometimes which are extremely specifically about India uh, and which probably uh, don't interest uh, anyone who doesn't work uh, on India, perhaps don't even interest many people who work on India. Uh, but uh, I also try to work on these other scales. So this is also a question of the movement of scales. Uh, and I think that uh, there are, uh, the historian must have different problems. And these problems must uh, operate on different geographical scales and on different geographical levels. Um, so, for instance, uh, 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 something which I worked on, and sometimes, you know, that also we write things because people want us to write them. So, someone asked me to write an article on the links between Italy and India in the 16th century. Now, this is a very cliched topic for those of you who have thought about it. So, everyone who talks about the links between Italy and India in the 16th century talks about three things. Ital Italian Jesuit missionaries, so like a Roberto de Nobili, for instance, who came to India. So that's one cliched topic. Then there are uh, Italian um, uh, Renaissance uh, humanists like uh, Filippo Sassetti, who came to, again to India. And then you can also go through the question of uh, some Italian jewelers uh, who came and traveled uh, in India, uh, like, uh, like uh, Gaspero Balbi, uh, Cesare Federici, and so on. So I decided that I would look for something unexpected. And I found an interesting sort of way of, of, of doing this by triangulating, which is I found that uh, in 16th century, in the first half of 16th century, there were actually these Genoese who were settled in Corsica, in Cap Corse. And these Genoese were specialists in building galleys. And so when the Portuguese actually came to India, of course they had their ships which they were using for their oceanic uh, movements, but they also wanted galleys essentially for coastal warfare. So how they actually proceeded to do this was they found that their, their galley builders in Portugal were not good enough for this. The, the, the Genoese were the cutting edge of this. So they brought these Genoese to India, settled them in Western India. And these Genoese then, uh, who were very um, um, difficult people, uh, then proceeded to write many letters of complaints. Right, which, are, which are in the archives, and you can actually go into the archives and, and reconstruct these family networks. There's a family which is called Baccioni, uh, where these men actually are triangulating between Italy and India through Corsica. And then, of course, they also have relatives who are left behind in Chios, and through whom they have dealings with the Ottoman Empire and so on and so forth. So you can actually see how these kinds of things work. Very uh, concrete, very specific, having to do with specific archival documents, but actually giving you a set of interesting uh, connections.
of this type. And eventually this has sort of taken me on to where I am right now, what I'm thinking about in terms of the last set of lectures which I gave in the Collège de France, which are uh, on reflecting very generally on the problem of what uh, the Germans and, and Dutch, especially uh, for the early modern period, tended to call ego documents. Right? So uh, autobiographies, uh, diaries, first person letters and so on, to see how these things work in different cultural contexts. Uh, again, uh, it's interesting to see who helps us think about this. Uh, you can go back to someone like uh, Georg Zimmel, if you want, who has actually reflected on this, or Marcel Mauss, who wrote some very interesting articles on this question of the, uh, the, the moi, the, 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 the first person and how it works in, in different cultures. But then the historian's work is still to go back and, 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 and work with it to see how generically these work in different places. Here, uh, conversing with the literary scholars is incredibly useful. Um, but anyway, so uh, to, to conclude, um, what I'm sort of trying to get at is uh, something you might say is fairly obvious, that uh, history is, a, is always an unfinished project. It's always an ongoing conversation. Uh, and um, in a way, uh, it's partly a question of the luck that you have about who happen to be your conversational partners. Uh, but it's also a question of uh, whether you're willing to have those conversations or not. <laughs> Happy birthday, indeed! Thank you uh, for this for this talk, Sanjay. And our, our next speaker is uh, Professor Kenneth uh, Pomeranz, and he's going to talk about connections and uh, contested macro history and early modern histories, comparisons, and continuities. We may or may not need these maps, but I thought I'd have them just in case, as a security blanket. Um, well, thank you very much. It is an enormous honor to be here. Um, and I could go on just about that for half an hour, but I don't think that's what you came for. Um, I also wanted to just briefly say, in, as I listened to Sanjay, two things in particular popped into my head. One was that, while it's wonderful to win a prize for macro history, what I think both of us stand for, in a sense, is the fact that you can't stay on one scale. That good history is about moving across scales for all kinds of reasons. Um, a second thing that occurred to me is that without intending to do so, I think we divided labor rather nicely. Um, because, of course, scale is a matter of both time and space. And Sanjay mostly spoke about space, and I will mostly speak about time. A distinguished audience that includes both historians and non-historians provides a good occasion for thinking about what history brings to our discussions about big human questions. For myself, as somebody who started out as a historian of the late 19th and 20th centuries, but is now better known for work on earlier periods, though I continue to work on recent history as well, I particularly relish a moment to reflect on what my work may have to say about the distinctiveness of modern times and what purchase we gain on understanding the modern world by looking back at large-scale dynamics in the centuries preceding it. This involves thinking about things we generally consider modern, which clearly did have early modern antecedents. For instance, ongoing commercialization, intensification of labor, both in agriculture and in handicrafts, increasing long distance flows of goods, ideas, diseases, um, increased vernacular literacy, 
which appears for various reasons in a number of places in roughly the same time period, and so on. But it also involves thinking about modern phenomena that appear largely unconnected to early modern dynamics, or even to mark a reversal of them, and about the dangers of teleological narratives and overly abstract models that minimize contingency and exaggerate long-run continuities. It also requires to think about relationships at regional or sub-regional levels, and those that appear to be the result of trans-regional interactions, of Sanjay's connected histories, but with differentiated regional effects, and thus about the status of both comparisons and connections in understanding macro history. The book I'm best known for, um, The Great Divergence, China, Europe, and the Making of a Modern World Economy, shows that as late as about 1750, China as a whole was roughly as rich, commercialized, etc., as Europe as a whole was. And perhaps more importantly, that the Yangtze Delta, China's richest region, was probably comparable in these respects to Holland and Britain. Some regions in Japan and India may have been comparable too. This suggests that the vast divergence in fortunes that soon followed is unlikely to have reflected some deep-seated blockage of the sorts that were often asserted in older explanations. If, for instance, property rights had been insufficiently secure to encourage profit-making in China, or the Confucian ethic had discouraged interest in manipulating the physical world, both claims that some earlier historians and sociologists had made, then the divergence in economic fortunes would surely have taken place much earlier. On the other hand, the book also rejects arguments favored by various nationalist scholars and some Marxists, which claim that vibrant commercial exchange in China or elsewhere represented an incipient capitalism, which would have inevitably turned into industrial capitalism in the absence of Manchu invasion, Western imperialism, or some other deus ex machina. Instead, I focus on a set of resource constraints common to multiple 18th century core regions, the limits of efforts to resolve those, effort, those problems through consensual trade alone, and the eventual role of both coal, which by substituting for massive amounts of timber, greatly relieved pressure on British agroforestry, and land-intensive resources, mostly from the Americas, in easing these ecological constraints and making possible a transition to a very different, much more resource-intensive kind of economy. And I emphasize possible, by no means inevitable. In doing this, I emphasize what I take to be a sharp discontinuity between the kind of growth envisioned by the classical economists such as Smith or for that matter, by modern theorists of rural-focused development, such as Esther Bozrup, and the very different dynamics of modern economic development, and further argue that institutions which facilitated growth within a Smithian framework quite successfully were not conducive to the distinctive kind of economic development that emerged in the 19th century. Consequently, notions of one or another place having been ahead on some preset path to modernity quite late in what we have come to call the early modern period need to be de-emphasized, if not completely dropped. Meanwhile, the role of geography, contingency, and of global conjunctures in producing sustained industrialization need to be foregrounded. And rather than continually asking why a given society failed to make such a transition, we should appreciate the surprising, indeed almost freakish nature of this having happened anywhere at any particular time. These arguments are not, of course, universally accepted, but the discussion they sparked has moved in productive ways. First of all, the notion of a late divergence has now been widely accepted, whereas not long ago it was quite common to claim that China had fallen behind irrevocably by 1,500 or even by 1,000. 
so has the methodological point, by no means exclusive to me, that we should not be comparing China to Britain just because they both happen to be modern nation, nation states and we have lots of data arranged in national units. China is more common to Europe as a whole. And both places were made up of a series of interacting regions with wildly different economies and that also had interactions with other regions outside boundaries of our conventional areas. The Yangtze Delta, as the wealthiest of Chinese regions, as I said before, bears comparison with England and Holland, a place like Gansu, perhaps with the Balkans. Third, the arguments I made about the high productivity of agriculture, including high labor productivity of agriculture in China and Japan, have been largely confirmed by subsequent research. Independent work has suggested that output per labor day in Yangtze Delta farming was within about 10% of that in Britain, placing it far above that anywhere else in Europe except the Netherlands, as late as 1820, while land productivity was eight times higher. So at the very least, a host of explanations that rooted industrialization in prior gains from the rise of agrarian capitalism, technologies of the so-called agricultural revolution, etc., are now, I think, pretty much finished. One has to look outside agriculture and see how forces emanating from elsewhere eventually pulled that sector into a new labor-saving world, rather than assuming that such a fundamental transformation had to begin within the largest sector of all 18th century economies. This heightens the contingency of the transition. If institutions that turned out to be not very conducive to an industrial breakthrough were quite functional for agriculture, which was at the time a far more important part of all economies, why should they have changed? My arguments about the precise ways in which ecological relief arrived in Northwestern Europe, in particular, the ways in which particular institutional arrangements, including slavery, structured the flow of land-intensive American products, including cotton, to an industrializing Britain, and my emphasis on a combination of factor-priced incentives and geographic luck, more than the particularities of European science, in explaining the coal and steam breakthroughs have been more controversial and were never meant to be the last word on these huge topics. But those discussions, I think, have also moved forward in significant ways, which again serve to highlight the uncertainty of movement from early modern to modern dynamics. In particular, I think refocusing our understanding of what it meant to integrate the Americas into a broader world economy from an older focus on how the profits made there might have contributed to European capital accumulation, profits that, at least in theory, could have been replaced by profits from investments elsewhere, and instead looking towards specific physical resources, not so clearly available on comparable scales elsewhere, at least not without radical in institutional restructuring, has been useful. There have also been fruitful discussions of how we assess the sustainability of very different kinds of development over specific spans of time, and how we describe developments which are explicable only in terms of trans-regional dynamics, but which had their most visible and dramatic outcomes in one particular place. Though I still participate in these discussions, my work has more recently moved in other directions, many still connected to economic and or environmental history. I must say, I was very pleased a few years ago when I gave a talk at Vanderbilt and the person who introduced me said, well, you know about Ken Pomeranz and his work on this, that, and the other thing, but my favorite article of his is one about praying for ra rain in a rural North China county in the early 20th century. I thought, yes, that's one of my favorites too. <laughs> and it's an illustrative, I think, of the importance again of you can never think just on the macro scale. If you lose touch with the local, the macro generalizations, as Sanjay said, become 
rather airy and useless. One of the things I've been doing in recent years quite a bit is working on the environmental dimensions of Chinese economic growth right up to today, focusing particularly on water supplies, which have huge global implications, in part because the Mekong, Chao Phraya, Brahmaputra, and several other major rivers all start in Tibet, and in part because any plan for China to reduce its ratio of water ratio to GDP which is a major goal of the regime right now, is probably also a plan for it to import vastly more food. In my more fully historical work, which is what it makes more sense to focus on here though, I've increasingly focused on thinking through the political and social implications of different types of economic development, rather than, as I needed to do for the Great Divergence, emphasizing that different kinds of early modern institutions could generate comparable levels of per capita output. One particular focus is tracing the implications of economic growth and commercialization without widespread proletarianization. In other words, without the emergence of a large number of free people dependent on wage labor. Something that was particularly prominent in various parts of East Asia, but hardly limited to there. In the Chinese case, some particularly significant implications of commercial dynamism with relatively little wage labor concerned frontier settlement and expansion. To briefly summarize a lengthy argument, the kinds of land and water rights which developed in China, though again not only there, plus the technical requirements of wet rice production, meant that almost all farmers after about 1500 were either smallholders who owned their land, or tenants, rather than either wage laborers or bondsmen. These same factors made tenants, tenants who were hard to evict, and so allowed them to earn a larger share of what they produced than any simple microeconomic model based on factor shares would predict. My neighbors in the economics department at the University of Chicago like to say that no one in history has ever washed a rented car. And this is a case in which they are absolutely wrong because the way that Chinese property relations were structured were such that tenants were tenants. They didn't own the land, but they had very strong expectations of being able to stay on it as long-term tenants as long as they met certain basic conditions so they, in fact, invested quite heavily in the land. They also bargained very, very hard to keep the rent down as productivity rose. At any rate, this meant that they earned far more than wage laborers or than the minority of tenants who were tenants at will, even if those people did the same work. Consequently, these tenants, not to mention the smallholders, also earned much more than unskilled urban laborers, since an employer in town had little reason to pay more than whatever minimum was needed to lure somebody who was engaged in rural wage labor. This fairly simple fact had various important consequences. One was that those who were proletarians had a very low rate of reproduction. As the poorest working people in society, they had a hard time competing for wives who were structurally scarce due to a combination of some sex-selective infanticide and some men who had both wives and concubines. This meant that despite centuries of intense commercial competition, which, as one would expect, produced winners and losers in every generation, the class of people dependent on wage labor didn't grow. It appears to have been about 10 to 15 percent of the labor force in the late 1600s and in the early 1900s, despite ongoing commercialization, since some people fell into the class of propertyless wage earners in each generation, but many members of that class from the previous generation had no descendants. It also meant that as population grew and average farm size shrank, in more commercialized regions 
most families found outlets for any extra labor they had in handicrafts. Light industry grew considerably, but remained mostly rural, with important consequences for its social and technological evolution. Secondly, it meant that any tenant or smallholder looking for upward mobility was better advised to move to the frontier and to the cities. The cities might have higher average incomes, but wage laborers earned such a small percentage of that average that you were actually better off going to some place where you had a reasonably good chance of getting land rights. Beginning in the 16th century and accelerating in the 18th, this produced massive waves of free migration towards various parts of China's interior, fundamentally altering the dynamics of Chinese expansion, something that had been previously dominated by state-sponsored colonization efforts on the one hand, usually oriented towards founding colonies that would feed garrisons, and the occasional relocation of great families bringing dependents with them on the other. The movement instead of large numbers of free plebeian migrants over very long distances without elite or state sponsorship was an early instance of what would become a more global phenomenon to some extent in the 18th century, but especially later on. This migration forms one part of a book I'm currently writing called Why is China so big? One that, again, asks us to consider both continuities and reversals linking the early modern and the modern period. It's a striking fact that roughly a quarter of humanity has been included within one polity, or much of the last 2,000 years, and almost all of the last 700, though the borders of that polity have shifted quite radically. Moreover, of the six states that cover roughly 40% of the Earth today, Russia, Canada, China, the US, Brazil, and Australia, five of them benefited from what Alfred Crosby called ecological imperialism, in which early modern settlers brought with them diseases to which the natives had no resistance, and also brought plants and animals that had no enemies in their new homes, greatly facilitating both conquest and colonization. Chinese expansion lacked those supports, making it slower and more negotiated, and in some ways even more striking. The People's Republic can also be seen as a successor to one of several large multi-ethnic empires that flourished between, let's say, 1400 and 1918. The others, Mughal, Ottoman, Romanov, Habsburg, etc., fractured into multiple states, as did, of course, Europe's overseas empire. But China today, as you can see on this map, includes almost all of the Qing realm, despite a century of incursions by stronger powers. The ongoing creation and recreation of this unity matters for both scholarly and other issues. Part of what's striking about China's migration boom is that for most of the period from 1500 to 1800 or so, the state actually tried to keep migrants out of frontier areas at least as often as it encouraged them. So the official ideology in the PRC today loves to paint this story of a, an endless um, teleological process in which both Chinese people and Chinese governance expanded outwards. Um, the flip side of that is a somewhat paranoid vision of China's march to the tropics, as one scholar called it. Um, what both ignore is that for most of this period, yes, there's a project of state expansion, yes, there's a pro there are massive popular migration, but they're actually more often working at cross purposes than together. The state was particularly hostile to unmarried male migrants, whom it regarded as particularly unruly, likely to clash with the indigenous population, lacking enough stake in society to be suitable for militia or other order-keeping institutions, and hopeless as representatives of any sort of Confucian civilizing mission. After all, if you're a single male and you are not producing descendants, you are 
essentially outside the Confucian project. Yet in the Southwest in particular, where so much of the topography made farming difficult or even impossible, a great many migrants wound up mining, logging, using highland timber to make charcoal or paper, hunting medicinal herbs, and so on. Occupations often carried out by wage laborers, and hence rarely attractive to settled farm families, and consequently drawing disproportionate numbers of precisely the young single males about whom the state was so ambivalent. Undoubtedly, many of these men were rowdy, especially when assembled in large groups. But because they came with few social supports, and many of them did want families, they often mixed with indigenous populations on relatively equal terms, with acculturation moving in both directions, forming a hybridized local society. This relatively harmonious behavior did not mollify Qing officials, who often seem to have thought that the only thing worse than lower class immigrants clashing with the indigenous population was lower class immigrants intermarrying with the indigenous population and joining their communities. And interestingly, both conflict and collaboration were often described in government documents as treachery. Um, you could even translate the word as treason. But around the turn of the 19th century, these attitudes began to change. During a series of rebellions concentrated in highland areas of the Southwest, official government troops were largely ineffective, while loyalist militia played an important role in turning the tide. The local officials and gentry who organized many of those forces recruited much of their personnel from precisely these occupational groups whom the Qing so distrusted. In the aftermath of their military successes, the organizers argued that with a little bit of assistance, these miners, loggers, etc., could settle down in one place rather than quickly stripping a resource and moving on. They would establish families, ten graves, and become good subjects. And in fact, they might even be better prospects for civilizing the frontiers than farmers were, given the ecological precarity of much highland agriculture. Furthermore, these men argued, morally and politically embracing non-farmers in this way was simply necessary, because there was no way to return these highlands to their pre-1500, very sparsely populated state. As this rethinking became more established, it led to an increasingly strong alliance of the state with Han settlers, in contrast to the long earlier period in which policies often relied on allying with ethnic minority elites to keep the frontier peaceful, or at least attempting to balance the interests of those ethnic minority elites with those of the immigrants. Moreover, these more aggressive ideas were soon applied on other frontiers as well including in Xinjiang and Mongolia, which could only accommodate mass immigration if many of the immigrants would do something other than farm. So in other words, you had to shed this idea that agriculture was the fundamental and most morally valuable occupation in order to imagine large portions of what is today China as territory that could be civilized and therefore was worth fighting for. These policies led to a massive increase in ethnic violence in the middle and late 19th century. And there were many moments at which the empire could have fragmented on a more or less permanent basis. In the longer run, we can also see several things going on here, though, that help explain why China's hard-pressed late Qing and post-Qing governments wound up willing to spend vast amounts of blood and treasure to hold these frontier regions, including regions that had rarely, if ever, been ruled from the central plain before, and which, until recently, had constituted such a large fiscal drain that many officials had advocated abandoning them when they were initially conquered in the 1700s. 
So again, nothing inevitable about the map we have today. First, we see an increasingly close alignment between the state and the Han majority, completed once the Qing themselves disappeared. Equally important, we see a new idea of what kinds of life were consistent with civilized behavior. And since the Chinese state conceived of itself as a representative of a civilizational ideal, thinking of places like Xinjiang as places where people could lead proper lives was a precondition for seeing them as places that could be treated just like the inner provinces, rather than as a buffer zone or the locus of a separate Central Asian Khanate that had just happened to have the same supreme ruler as China's Confucian monarchy. To look at things from another perspective, more familiar to modern Westerners, a great deal of scholarly attention has focused on China's shift from a so-called tributary model of international relations to a Westphalian one, pushed upon them by the West. But acceptance of that model, in which each state was fully responsible for whatever happened anywhere within its borders, required that the Qing and its successors think of all the territory it claimed as territory that it could tame, inhabited by people it could, quote, civilized. Not keeping order on the frontier, after all, had particularly serious consequences in the age of gunboat diplomacy. Last but not least, the increasing embrace of non-agricultural livelihoods was a crucial step in a transition from seeing borderlands as mostly liabilities, which one occupied solely to prevent something bad from happening there, to seeing them as not only potentially self-supporting with enough settlers, but as potential El Dorados, and towards seeing the settlers themselves not as marginal, even dangerous people who had been unable to fill normative roles in heartland society, to seeing them as hardy pioneers and eventually as the vanguard of the nation. All of this was part of a Chinese route to what Benedict Anderson characterizes as a central task of imperially sponsored official nationalisms more generally. And Anderson's phrase is that they must stretch the short, tight skin of the nation over the gigantic body of the empire. Lastly, for now, I've been trying to think about implications of this and lots of other work for how we teach history, especially at the introductory level, where I'm working on a basic world history textbook, among other things. Here I see a confluence between macro-historical research that points away from seeing world history as an assemblage of national histories, focusing and instead focuses on networks and processes at other levels, and the need for teaching that treats students not as blank slates on which we can inscribe facts, but as people who already have in their heads a variety of narratives derived from K-12 education, popular culture, and so on, which we need to make more explicit in order to reveal their distortions. Many of these narratives depend on a social evolutionary set of stages that treat different simultaneously existing groups as if they somehow belong to different moments, and which also posit a natural sequence of events which, if it does not unfold, must reflect some sort of blockage or deviation. Many others rely on the fiction of particular peoples as trans-historical realities, the Chinese being a prime example, in spite of enormous amounts of evidence that this continuity was constructed long after what are taken to be the group's origins, and evidence that these groups have no more genetic or cultural continuity than many others to whom we deny a trans-historical label. Nobody, for instance, thinks, speaks of contemporary Mayans, but there's probably as, not, as much continuity between them and contemporary Mexicans as between the people we call Chinese and the population of China several hundred years ago. Uh, this is actually 
I don't have time to say much about this map, but the basic thing that, what you, is that you see here is population that is today called Han, the Chinese, majority Chinese ethnic group, north of the Yangtze River, has more in common with the ethnic minority groups north of the Yangtze River than it has with the people who are labeled ethnic Han south of the Yangtze River. And those people, in turn, have more in common with the ethnic minorities with whom they share that space than they do with their supposed fellow nationals north of the Yangtze River. And indeed, if I had a better map, it would probably show you they also share more with the populations of much of Southeast Asia. To conclude, we cannot do without macro histories and macro narratives, but we also cannot do without constant questioning of them. And if history teaches anything, it should teach the necessity of a constant movement back and forth across multiple geographic and temporal scales, never taking any one of those scales as giving us the only worthwhile story. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> we have asked uh, two of our colleagues. Uh, Migrations. <laughs> we have asked two of our colleagues, one from the uh, East Asian Department and one from the Department of History. Uh, Oris, Oris Sela, who is now chair of the Department of East Asian History, and uh, Oded Obinovich uh, from the Department of, uh, of History, uh, to comment and to ask questions and to help us conclude this, uh, this interesting encounter with these two great historians. Ori and Oded, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for such um, lively and stimulating talks. I guess the biggest I guess the biggest temptation we both have to avoid, I think, is to jump really into the details and start discussing to the mic to the micro details of like the role of Esther Bosrop in contemporary models, etc., and to kind of stay on the macro level to the benefit of a very broad audience. And the first thing I'd like to raise is I'm very happy to see numerous students here, both at the undergraduate and the graduate level. And I guess we were wondering that the usual way to get to study and eventually practice history on a global scale or on a macro scale was to start small and then to expand your horizons and do broader and broader research projects. But we're both under the impression that today students are interested in the macro level from a very early stage and they like to get at those questions much earlier and to develop their own interest in those directions. Do you have any advice for people both interested in reading, learning, thinking on a macro level and potentially even developing research projects at that scale? Yeah, um, no, you know, I suppose I have the advantage or the confusion of having taught in many different places. So uh, it's, it's, I would say partly the answer to this question depends on where you are. Uh, so uh, it's true that, for instance, if you are in, in the US, where I teach a lot of the time right now, um, you know, you can uh, get a first exposure to these large-scale histories. For instance, we teach uh, introductory level courses on on world history. I never, you know, had the occasion to have these as an undergraduate myself, and even today in Delhi, say, it's not taught in that way. But of course, those are courses which are taught out of textbooks. And, um, and uh, they're perfectly uh, good textbooks insofar as they go, but they're not something which actually shows you, uh, in a way, how uh, uh, research questions uh, are, uh, in, 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 a sense, in a sense, treated, or not in an adequate way. However, once you get to the, to the graduate level, you have the advantage, again, in certain systems and not in others. I mean, for instance, I remember being very shocked to learn when I was in England that the amount of time you actually had to finish a dissertation was so small, so small, that the whole idea that, for instance, you could learn a, a slightly complicated language, I mean, this is not talking about learning Italian when you're French, 
but it's let's say like Ken. Uh, I mean, you 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 are not native Chinese, obviously, and you didn't learn Chinese at an early part of your career. You had to learn it to do your research, right? Now, in in certain circumstances, such as for example, if you're in Chicago or in UCLA, you can actually construct. You can take the time to construct, in spite of pressure from the deans and everything, uh, a, a complex problem requiring multiple trainings. And that's what I often encourage my students to do, which is let's, let's try to construct what your problem is, then let's see what the skills you need are, let's see how we're going to get you those skills, right? Um, and is it feasible, is it not feasible? And very often it is, it is uh, feasible in that, in that system. I mean, you know, I had to do funny things when I was a student for learning skills. I mean, for instance, I wanted to learn Dutch. There was no one who taught Dutch in Delhi, right? So actually, eventually, I found a friend of a friend who put me in touch with the wife of the commercial counselor in the Dutch embassy, who was a school teacher at a loose end, and who taught me Dutch in her spare time for free. Right? Now, this is very different than if you're trying to learn Dutch in UCLA, where it's like falling off a log, right? You can do it in six months. So uh, uh, I would say that the questions differ, but I think the opportunities also differ. And, but I also have to say that this leaves me with a somewhat un, uh, uncomfortable sentiment because, for instance, I then see why, um, you know, um, uh, Indian students now don't want to stay in India to do their research because they see that they don't have the resources, they don't have the possibilities. So there's a kind of a, now an ongoing process which all of us, I mean, what do we do? We get these applications we, and we pay for these people to come. But there's a sort of a, a, a global uh, academic migration of graduate students which is taking place simply because of the way in which these resources are structured. So I would say the, the, the answer to the question depends on where, where you are. And I would love uh, a situation in which we could give better opportunities to people in different places rather than getting people to move because in only some places you have the resources. I would fully endorse everything that Sanjay said. Let me just add a couple of other things. One is that a lot also depends on what type of history and what time period of history you're interested in. Close, there are, for instance, ways to do a manageable project that moves across vast spaces and can be done even as a dissertation. You know, if you can, are able to latch on to specific groups of people, specific objects that move, etc. There are a lot more of those as you get towards modern times. And you could look at, say, dam builders across the globe who are all trained at about half a dozen institutions, right, and have connections with each other and are all watching each other's projects. You can look at the movement of particular commodities, etc. There are of particular texts that people react to all around the world. So there are ways of doing projects that are more or less global and focused enough to be a bit beginning project. Nonetheless, since you not only want to write a dissertation, but you want to get a job, and as much as we may talk about global history, the vast majority of jobs advertised are still advertised in national histories, it does become essential, both as a practical matter, but I think also as a good epistemological training to think about some particular chunk of the globe. Um, you know, um, in the introduction today, we heard that you know, one of the things that distinguishes historians, who are sometimes thought of as not having a method, but I think we do and we need to be more open about it. And part of it is the conviction, which comes out, I think, most strongly in our teaching more than our scholarship that there are connections across many registers of human experience, right? That if you're a historian of, let's say, France, right, you may be purely an intellectual historian as a researcher or purely an economic historian or whatever, but if you teach a course on 19th century France, the falling birth rate will be in there, 1848 will be in there, Kant and positivism will be in there, and the students have a legitimate right to expect that you will find some relationships among them, right? That is part of what we do, and 
manage all those different registers of experience. You have to manage them in some particular time and, time and space. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll connect with what you just said about the uh, need to find a job. Um, I agree about the second project, but sometimes the job is pressing. Um, when I began my graduate studies at uh, Princeton, one of the things that I was interested in was uh, both uh, Sanskrit, which I've studied uh, here long before, and Chinese. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about combining the two, not through Buddhism, apologies, um, and one of the advice that I got, well actually not one, but many people told me, do not do that. You will find no job whatsoever. And this brings me to the question. One of the things that I find, correct me if you think I'm wrong, that's uh, really missing, I see that in Asian studies departments such as ours, um, is the discussion of the connections and comparison within Asia and especially between what we call now India, the Indian subcontinent, and the Chinese uh, bases. Mm -hmm. um, in, in particular, my, my interest is in the early modern or, or Qing period or Mughal period. These kind of connections and comparisons seems to me to have been relatively uh, almost, they're, they're non-existent. There, there are a few, uh, um, there's a little bit scholarship on that. So my question is basically, how do we get past this uh, notion that we connect, but with uh, Europe, we compare, but with Europe, and occasionally with uh, the Ottomans? Um, Can I jump into that? Of course. So, you know, it's true, and it's something which has, by the way, been on my mind for, for, for quite a while. I, you know, I used to, uh, for several years, co-teach a seminar with Bin Wong uh, in, in UCLA, where we actually did exactly that. So we did both India and China, but we also did things which were outside both of our comfort zones. So we did Korea. And we did, we did Southeast Asia, which you know, neither, neither of us feels totally comfortable with, but, well, fair enough, you know. Um, and uh, I have to say that, um, uh, the, you know, some years ago, maybe eight or ten years ago, my, uh, my friend uh, Sheldon Pollock called me and said, you know, I want to do, well, you know, Sheldon Pollock, of course, always has mega projects. So uh, he wanted to do a He's mega... My, my Sanskrit teacher. Right. I mean. so, so he wanted to do this mega project, and he said, uh, who should I be talking to? He may not care to remember this, but I told him, I told him, pick up the telephone and speak to Benjamin Elman. And so then he did, and there's now the volume which has come out in which Ken has a chapter, which is exactly this thing of looking at India and China together, uh, a series of co-authored chapters. Uh, you wrote yours with Shumit Guha, I think. Right. And uh, which is actually trying to do this. It's not just historical. I think being Pollock, there's a large dose of, I would call it sort of intellectual history and, and so on and so forth. But I think that now uh, this is, this, it's, it's no longer, uh, you know, off, off the limits and off the charts. I was hoping, actually, that the fact that there was there were several people who had this kind of, um, in a way, double training, would have made this happen earlier. You know, so we had several people uh, rooted in Indian history, like Prasenjit Dwara, like Sucheta Mazumdar, uh, and so on and so forth, who uh, who knew Indian history well and then trained themselves in Chinese history. And I remember having a long conversation with Wang Hui, with whom I spent a lot of time in. Uh, years ago, where he was talking about Chinese historians who were getting interested in, 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 in India. Um, so this is actually, it is actually happening. But you know, there are also historical reasons why, you know, India and China turn their backs on one another. And it isn't only 1962. It goes back, uh, it goes back before that. But there are interesting things. I mean, just to give you, a, again, a small project, which is um, uh, um, a half Indian, half Chinese historian called Anand Yang, uh, has written this book about um, about a, an Indian soldier who actually went to China in the suppression of the Boxer Rebellion, and who served, you know, with the uh, with the uh, colonial armies, and then wrote a memoir about his experiences in the Boxer Rebellion. An interesting instance of a kind of connected history. So, yes, you're right. Not enough, but uh, I think that we are uh, in 2019 in a much better place than we were in, uh, let's say, uh, 1990. Again, I mean, I would agree with all of that and want to add a couple of things. And one is that 
if we're going to look at these connections more, the connections are often going to run through other peoples and other places, Most, many, yeah. right, many of which have nobody to champion them today because there no nation state claims them, right? Or the nation state that claims them is relatively poor and does not produce a huge academic establishment. Um, we know a lot more, for instance, about the Arab seafarers who came to Canton than we do about those from Champa, right? And I think we can all guess why that is true, right? Um, and similarly, as you go through the other way by land through Central Asia, right? You have all sorts of people who today either, either there is no state that claims them as, as an ancestor or the one that does, does so very, very tenuously. And because so much of the teaching of history which is what then, in most cases, causes resources to go into history, is, is organized around national communities. Um, we face a real struggle, and if, if we're going to get a connected history of Asia, it's going to have to have a lot more attention to people who have fallen off the map, so to speak. So I would emphasize that both biologically and culturally, they may have plenty of descendants in the world today. They just don't have a state to speak for them. In fact, I would uh, <coughs> you just add very quickly two more examples. You may know the recent work uh, of Tan Sen Sen on the one side and of Matthew Mosca on the other. So both of whom actually are doing this work which is connecting these two worlds, one for an earlier period and in the case of Mosca for the 19th century. Um, so again, I think this is, we are in a better place than we were. Though, I mean, it's true that there was a moment in, let's say, the 1930s you know, when, let's say, Tagore's university had invited Chinese to India uh, and so on and so forth, where there was a sort of a moment of uh, interest and, and so on, and then it kind of dropped uh, and so on. So, um, yeah, uh, the, uh, the, the, la the last thing I would say is, again, I mean, it would be a pity if all of this work gets uh, done uh, only in the United States. Uh, uh, so I would actually be, be uh, much happier if there was a sort of more even distribution of places where such work was. was. Matthew Mosca and uh, Tansen are on uh, some uh, special issues that I'm working on. Uh -huh. So I'll deal with you. Um, Odin? Ten, ten minutes. Ten minutes. Um, I guess uh, since we're celebrating here the award related to the past, we were actually wondering to what extent would you care to talk about the present and the future in terms of how thinking about the present and the future help you to imagine the historical problems you're working on? Are there any uh, advice for working on the past helps you to imagine the present and the future? Yeah. Well, I, you know that um, this is a problem which you have because, I mean, frankly, um, very often, again, coming back to the teaching part of our profession, uh, it's, it's an issue which we face, which is, you know, that famous phrase is something which one has to, in one fashion or another, constantly tell your students, which is that uh, the past is a foreign country and they do things differently there. Uh, because your students will often push you constantly into a kind of a presentism. They want to actually directly see some relationship between what is happening today? I mean, you know, my wife who teaches uh, French history and European history in UCLA used to have someone who used to constantly try to get her to explain people in 19th century French history in terms of, oh, so this guy is more like Obama and that guy is more like George W. Bush and so on. So, you know, that, 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 this is, this is a, 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 real, a, a real problem. So I think it's, it's actually something which one has to be very careful about, which is not to this to move in a, but not in a promiscuous way between, between past, present, and, 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 and future, but do so very carefully, right? And, um, and I would say in any event with regard to the future, I mean, whether you do it consciously, subconsciously, in a, you know, your, the limits of your imagination are, are based on your experience. So, I mean, you know, it's like the, 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 the kind of um, uh, joke which I once had with a, 
from colleagues about how, you know, when people imagine meeting people from outer space, you know, aliens and so on and so forth, you realize that actually all they're doing is taking tropes of people meeting other strange people, right? And, and just transferring them, because they don't imagine these people from outer space being anything else but sort of deformed human beings. Right? And you can see there the limits of the imagination is actually based on, on uh, the possibilities which are given to you by, by, by experience. So, I mean, I don't think it's a, for me, this is not a tremendous problem. It's something which we do anyway. And I think the problem for me is exactly the contrary, which is not to constantly think about the past in terms of the categories of the present. That is, I think, the real challenge for historians to actually say to their students and so on, you know, actually, these guys who were sitting in the 14th century were not like you and me in many, many ways. Yeah. Um, but sometimes it does seem to me that one encounters in the past problems that you can see recurring, in, you know, always with some differences, but enough similarity to be worth putting on the table, often that's so that in the end you can say, yeah, but it's different now because of X, Y, Z. Often I find the relationship, at least that I have, between present events and studying history is more one of irritation, right? That I see some narrative that takes for granted that this or that current situation is what we've always seen. And I say, wait a minute, you know, I think that was put together relatively recently. Or I'm aware of some narrative that's being promoted, you know, whether it's in a textbook or a, some aspect of popular culture or whatever, that seems to me to seriously distort the past in order to naturalize something of the present. Right? I mean, if history aims to, at least to some extent, make the, str the strange familiar, in other words, to say, yes, the past was different, but we can't understand it, it also should aim to make the familiar strange. Right? To say, you know, this thing we take for granted today, whether it's a national boundary or whether it's modern consumerism, or whether it's you know, any other thing, you know, we shouldn't naturalize it. Right? So we shouldn't say that, oh yes, people have always sought to maximize their possession of material goods in more or less the way that economics tell us humans do. Those, those, those desires were a product of historical processes. The more Maybe one way of talking about it is to simply assert, again, as we heard in the introduction, everything's got a history. And what that means, among other things, is that you know, even things as basic and we might think of as you know, fundamental as gender and sexuality, right, which sometimes imagine are just hardwired into our bodies, well, yes, there are aspects that are hardwired into our bodies, but there are other aspects that we know aren't because we can look back and see hey, they didn't think about it this way. Question? No last question. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Sorry, we ran out of time. This has been quite wonderful, actually. And I wanted to thank everyone. I wanted to thank you two first, uh, so Ken Pomerantz and Sanjay Subramanian. I wanted to thank uh, Miri for her excellent uh, introduction. I wanted to thank uh, Oded and, uh, uh, and Ori and uh, the organizers uh, and of the uh, Dan David Prize. Uh, thank you all. And uh, well, those of you from the School of History, we expect to see you in exactly 20 minutes in our next thing. Thank you. And